Okay, so today we have the pleasure of having here uh, Martin Lenz, who is a neighbor, and to talk about uh, slimming down to frustration. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so th the thing I want to tell you about today uh, is self-assembly. It's a very smart people doing self-assembly, and I'll tell you what smart self-assembly looks like. So say you have a um, you know, target structure in mind, and you want to assemble it. So what you're going to do is that you're going to take elementary particles, which you are going to design in a way that if you leave them to their own device, they'll come together, and they'll uh, you know, get together and form that target structure that you had in mind. Well, I can't do that. So what I'm going to tell you about today is stupid self-assembly. Stupid self-assembly is you just take a bunch of particles that have no specific shapes, and then you leave them at their own device, to their own device, and, and you look at what the end result looks like. And the reason for looking at this problem actually comes from a biological or biophysical inspiration. And that has to do with a number of pretty terrible diseases, actually, where there's proteins inside their cells which are not supposed to aggregate uh, in whatever way. They're supposed to stay soluble. But then some accident happens, either a misfolding of the proteins or perhaps a mutation. And following that accident, they start to aggregate. And there's a very peculiar fact about this aggregation that all those different proteins almost systematically form fibers. And those fibers, in many cases, are pathological and you know, can interfere with endocytosis inside your cells, causing Alzheimer's, uh, some forms of anemia, uh, and um, some form of um, um, diabetes, for instance. Okay, so those are important problem uh, problems from a, from a health standpoint, and people have been studying them for a while. Uh, and typically, they've done that with the approach of structural biologists. And what structural biologists look like is that they tell you what the detailed molecular interactions are that will give you each of those structures. And in each case, to a large extent, they come up with a different explanation. So my goal here is not to question those explanations, but rather to take a step back from that level of description and then ask whether perhaps beyond those detailed molecular differences, there could be a common, molecular, a common generic physical reason while why all those objects would have a tendency to aggregate into structures that are not uh, amorphous clumps or crystals, but rather fibers. Now, what would that reason be? Well, um, perhaps the idea is the following. And the idea is that uh, as uh, opposed to all the structures that you're uh, you know, used to, colloids or maybe atoms that form those clumps or those uh, crystals, proteins are actually objects that are very irregular geometrically. So let's try to think about what happens if you take very irregular objects with um, ridges and valleys, with sticky patches and then patches that are non-adhesive, and you take two of those objects and you try to put them together. Right? They're adhesive enough that they're going to stick eventually. And what's going to happen is that because they have those strange shapes, those two objects are going to have to negotiate for a while, and then perhaps they're going to find some optimal orientation, and maybe they're going to deform a little bit, such as to fit with the most favorable energy that you can have, okay? So maybe you form a dimer out of this. But now imagine there's a third identical particle that comes in, and it wants to stick to the existing aggregate. The thing is, the best binding spot is actually taken already. So maybe it's going to have to settle for the second best. Or maybe it's going to have to negotiate with the proteins that are already there and deform, again, the whole structure and fit in some way that is going to be favorable and angelically. So that second binding event, I argue, will probably be less favorable energetically because it's more constrained. And now imagine that you come in with a fourth protein, a fifth, etc., and presumably overall uh, aggregation is going to become less and less favorable energetically. The energy bonus that you get upon an additional binding event is going to diminish. And then at some point, perhaps, it's going to become less than the chemical potential of the solution. In such a situation, you would naturally expect that aggregation will cease after a certain number of binding events, or, in other words, that you might have a tendency to form finite size aggregates. Now, what I'd like to propose is that you will not only form finite size aggregates, 
but rather that there's a structure that can be a good compromise between the tendency to stick and that increasing frustration upon subsequent binding events. And those structures would actually be fibers. Now, why are fibers good? And it's just a hand-waving argument in the most literal sense. Uh, well, because you have a lot of uh, sticking happening inside a fiber because it's an extended object, a large object with a lot of contacts. But at the same time, the fiber has a finite diameter. And that means that each particle inside your aggregate is actually close to the surface. And the surface is where you have the freedom to relax all your constraints that give rise to the frustration. So maybe that structure is not so bad either from the point of view of frustration. And it's that kind of idea that I'd like to explore with you today. Now, even though the model that I've given to you, or the hand-waving waving model is uh, surely way oversimplified, uh, it's actually still too complicated to tackle uh, from a theoretical standpoint. So what I'll do is that I won't uh, tell you about those deformable objects with uh, very strange shapes, but rather I will try to take two extreme cases that represent two of the contributions to frustration that I've tried to describe. The first model that I'll tell you about will have to do with this aspect that to fit together the particles have to deform somewhat and that there's a cost associated to this deformation. And the second model uh, will be quite different, but even, even though it's going to be quite different, we're going to see that we're going to uh, find uh, a fairly similar phenomenology than the one that we had in the first case, which perhaps will reassure us that what we find is not a pure, um, a pure artifact of the way that we've posed pose the problem. And that second model will insist on the idea that one of your particles has some spots that it likes to bind with and some other spots that are maybe much less binding. And then, um, I mean, I've told you the word frustration several times already. And you might at some point wonder what I mean by this. And the real answer to that question is that I don't really know what I mean by it. But perhaps in the third part, I'll tell you a little bit about the meaning, the meaning of frustration that is quite popular in the soft matter community these days. And I'll try to argue that uh, the examples that you're going to be looking at today do not exactly match with this idea of frustration. So let me start with this idea of particles that are deformable. And that's uh, work that we've conducted with Tom Whitten at the University of Chicago. And the way in which we look at uh, particles that aggregate together is actually extremely simple. Because our picture of particles is just polygons in two dimensions. And what I'd like to do is to distinguish between two types of polygons to start with, the nice polygons and the bad polygons. The nice polygons are the one that if you put several of them together, then they'll just have a tendency, well, they won't have a tendency, but they have the capacity to fit together without any gaps and without needing to deform them in any way. They, in other words, tile the plane, and so they might um, create large space-spanning aggregates without incurring any frustration. But obviously, that's a very special case, and if you take a generic polygon, uh, it will look much more like those irregular hexagons with, with alternating short and long sides. And if you try to put them together, what you already see from this picture is that even with this small number of polygons, I'm having to twist them a little bit and to squeeze them to uh, create a compact aggregate, even for this small size. Right? And you can see it by the fact that uh, those lines are not perfectly horizontal. So those things do not style the plane. And if I want to make a tight packing, I will have to pay some energy cost for the deformation. So what kind of structures can you form with such type of particles? Well, you can form many types of structures. But what I'd like for you to consider for the moment is two extremes. One extreme is a tree. That's a structure that you can form by just sticking the sides two by two and therefore without uh, imposing any deformation on your particles whatsoever. So that's great in terms of that first type of energy that I've told you about before, frustration. It costs no frustration energy. But at the same time, uh, those trees have a huge amount of surface. And so that's going to cost a lot in terms of non-realized bonds, in terms of surface energy, in terms of aggregation energy. <coughs> the other extreme 
is to actually squeeze each of your particles down to a shape that will actually be able to tile the plane. And there, you might form a bulk, which will give you a fairly large frustration energy, but at the same time, will have no surface whatsoever, because we know that a three-dimensional or you know, two-dimensional object has a negligible amount of structure in the thermodynamic limit. And so my proposal is that fibers could actually be a compromise between those two structures, uh, which uh, could give you a good trade-off between stickiness and frustration. So let me tell you in a little bit more detail how I model those objects. Uh, sorry. Yes. So you don't consider at all the entropy. So this you are no zero temperature. zero temperature. Why do I do this? Because typically the binding energies in those systems are counted in units of tens of kT. Right, so thermal agitation is probably not the dominant effect. So I'll tell you how I model my uh, my particles, right? And um, I have two terms for the energy. Uh, one of them related to the frustration, and one of them to the aggregation. And the frustration is an energy that lives in each of the particles. And to understand how those particles work, what I would like to you for you to do is to think of a rubber balloon. How does a rubber balloon work? There's a pressured gas inside that's being confined by a tense membrane. And it's the competition between uh, those two forces that gives the balloon its rigidity. And that's exactly what I do here. I have an energy for each particle that is one over the area. This is low when the area is large. So it's like the pressure of the gas. But at the same time, I have the membrane here that is the juxtaposition of uh, elastic, sorry, uh, Hookian springs. Right? That wants, just like the membrane of your balloon, they want to shrink down to a point, but they can't because of the gas, so you're reaching some kind of equilibrium that gives you something rigid. And the way in which I can make the polygon irregular with size of different lengths at equilibrium is by, en um, by endorsing those uh, different Hookian springs with different spring constants. That's the physics of one particle. And now, um, there's a bit about stickiness. And before I explain to you how I count it, I have to tell you that adhesion is, again, an extremely simplified notion in my system, because it's a completely all or nothing concept. So when you have two particles, either their sides are completely disjointed, or they're completely identified, which means that you're going to treat the vertices at the end of that edge that is stuck together as uh, completely identical. Okay, so it's really a binary notion, which really allows me to endow each of my aggregates with a notion of topology, who's connected to whom. And my energy of adhesion is going to be only a function of this topology, because I'm going to say, I'm going to give a cost sigma to each orange edge that is not uh, part of a bond, that is exposed to the outside world. Okay. Um, all right. So yes, the length of the of the pot, the, the, of the of the polygon is fixed. So L one, L two, L three, they are continuous or uh, they are continuous variables. Absolutely. So and I think it's exactly the point that I wanted to get to. There is two ways of describing your aggregate. There is the topology, and then on top of that you have the geometry. Where are the vertices? Okay. The topology is very difficult to optimize in terms of uh, finding the ground state of the real structure because, you know, I sold to you that it was a frustrated problem. Well, the problem of frustrating systems is that they're frustrated, so it's very hard to find their ground state. But the geometrical problem is actually very easy. If I fix the topology and I ask the computer to minimize the energy with respect to the position of the vertices, it takes, you know, one second or something like this. So what I always do is that I let the position once the topology is fixed, I let the position of those vertices relax to the position that corresponds to a minimum of energy. And you know, that's what dictates the length of, uh, of your site. Right? But again, for convenience, and you, know, you can physically argue that it's not unreasonable in some cases, um, my surface tension is not the function of the actual length, but rather of the number of sites that are exposed. So you fix the contact method. And then you, given that, you relax. Uh, yes, so you, you find the optimal length. Once I've chosen a contact network, I find the optimal length. And then the next part that I'm going to tell you is how I search for the right contact network. Okay. All right. 
So um, yes, now that I have an energy, right, I can uh, perhaps make my previous discussion a little bit more uh, quantitative, and especially this comparison between trees and, and bulk. So what you know is that, and so yes, I'm going to uh, plot the energy per particle as a function of surface tension for each of those two extreme structures. And the bulk has no surface, so essentially in the thermodynamic limit, its energy is independent of sigma. It's just a constant. While the tree has an amount of surface that you can calculate exactly very easily, actually, and um, an energy that is, so yes, you have an extensive amount of surface in a tree, and so that means that your energy is going to be proportional to sigma. It's going to go at that line. So since I told you, well, first of all, to make my problem a little bit more easy, I'm just going to rescale the tension and the energy to say that the point at which those two curves uh, cross defines sigma tilde equals 1 and e tilde equals 1. Right? And now, my next step is, uh, you remember that I suggested that the fibers might be the right compromise between those two structures. So if, gonna, if they're going to appear anywhere, it's probably going to be around sigma tilde equals 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take sigma tilde close to 1, let's say, and I'm going to run a simulation and see what kind of structure I obtain. So how do I run the simulation? How do I choose my contact mode, right? Uh, well, the way, the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to take the first particle here, and I'm going to bring in the second particle, and I'm going to ask how I can stick it to the first one, right? So maybe I can stick it in this way, or that way, or that way, or maybe I can stick two sides there, and I'm going to try all the possible ways of sticking the next particle to the first. I'm going to compute their energy, and I'm going to choose the best one. So it's a deterministic algorithm, and it's a greedy algorithm. It's a local optimization. It's not um, guaranteed to give me the ground state of my system whatsoever. But maybe it's not such a bad idea because it's known that the way in which those protein fibers uh, form in vivo is actually irreversible. So, um, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the, the second one and then the third one. I'm going to stick to the existing aggregate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, never coming back on one of the previous particles that I've stuck to my aggregate. So now I'll just show you what the computer does with this. And in the beginning, you have something that's pretty you know, undetermined. But then at some point, your system uh, finds something, finds some kind of an attractor. And then it continues on and on, deterministically, right? since my, is, my uh, algorithm is deterministic, to form this long fiber. And actually, this fiber is infinitely long. And the mathematical definition of infinity here is long enough for my audience to get bored, so I guess that completes proof. So all right, that's what happens for a certain value of sigma tilde is somewhere around 1. Let's look around a little bit at higher and lower surface tensions. Those are my fibers here. And um, at higher tensions, what I get are bulks, as anticipated. So that's good. And if I go to lower surface tensions, I get trees. But you're going to tell me, wait, wait a second, that doesn't look like a tree. It doesn't look like a tree, but it's actually a tree. And the way to see this is to understand something about my aggregate. If I grow a tree and I have two branches that happen to come back on top of one another, I have no energy penalty for this. So what you have here is actually convoluted, convoluted trees that just run over one another and make this soup of branches, if you will. And the way to see this is that I've marked the out outer boundary of my aggregate orange. And you see that this boundary here is strongly re-entered. OK. And then in the middle lie the fibers. And the fibers don't occur for sigma tilde around 1, but rather for sigma tilde is somewhere around 2. So you might say, well, it's no big deal. I mean, it's of order 1. It's fine. Um, but actually, the problem gets a little bit deeper here. And it gets deeper if you plot the energy of those fibers compared to the energy of the bulk and of the tree. Here you have three blue triangles, which correspond to all those three fibers. But actually, the other symbols correspond to all the other fibers that I'm going to show you in this section of the talk. And for all of them, the conclusion is the same. Their energy is larger than the energy of the bulk. So one thing is certain. Even though I've tried to sell you energetic arguments for what 
the best structure would be, it's quite clear that the fibers that I'm going to show you are not the ground state of your system. So at best, they're a good metastable state. But even that is not proven yet. So I'll try to address this question. And the way in which I do this is, you know, the thing that you always do for metastability, you have a structure that you think is metastable, so you're going to disturb it a little bit and see if it remains robust to the small perturbation. And the way in which I'm going to perturb the uh, assembly aggregate, the, the uh, aggregation, sorry, the aggregation protocol of those structures that I've shown you is actually going to help me also address another problem that I've uh, pointed before. And it's the fact that because your um, aggregation is completely sequential, you can make a bad move. You can add a particle to the aggregate here. And you know, as the aggregate further develops, that particle that you put here is going to become very, very compressed and very, very inconvenient energetically. And you would really like to remove it to make your, your energy better, but you can't in the algorithm that I've told you about before. So I'm going to make a slightly different algorithm that will allow me to remove bad particles. And the way I'm going to do it is still deterministically. I'm going to add the particle in the best way that I can, then add another, and then look at all the particles that I have and remove the one that is going to help me, that, you know, that is going to allow me to um, uh, release, you know, to make my energy as favorable as possible. So I'm going to do add, add, remove, add, add, remove, add, add, remove, etc., until I've grown an aggregate that's as large as the ones that I've had up there. And, and here, so <coughs> yes, when you remove, the energy goes down. I mean, there is no barrier, or there is a barrier. So just remove, and the energy goes down, or there is some reorganization. Uh, there is geometrical reorganization, okay. but no topological reorganization okay. beyond, you know, removing the particle from its neighbors. Okay. And the geometrical reorganization, there is a little bit of cost, or no, or, or just go down the energy. I'm just asking whether yes. we should think, uh, because as you say, the uh, you say that the typical energy scale are uh, much larger than the temperature. So yes, I, I'm trying to. Yes. I mean, so the energy, the, always, the energy of the rest of the structure, yes. the elastic energy of the rest of the structure, always goes down okay. because you remove constraints from okay. the elastic problem of you know the rest of the of the aggregate. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, you know, what happens? Well, pretty much nothing, right? The structures that you form in this new case are very very similar to the ones that you had before. So that's good. Mm -hmm. They look fairly robust, right? But now I've told you about metastability, and you know, I think we've all been to physics school or something like that, and what they tell you there is that a good example of a metastable system is, for instance, a supercooled liquid, okay? And when you have a supercooled liquid, you can force it to form the more stable crystalline phase by taking a nucleus of that crystal and putting it in your liquid. Presumably, it's going to grow and give you the more crystalline phase. So what I'd like to do now is to you know, test whether it works for this system. So I'm going to take the nucleus, that orange nucleus, off the bulk phase, which is presumably more stable than my fibers, and I'm going to see what happens. While the bulk is unaffected, the trees remain trees, but the fibers here do, well, something intermediate, right? They become much more broader, much more bulky, but at the same time, they retain that characteristic of unidirectional growth, which tells you that your fiber formation is somewhat robust in this system. And I want to uh, I want you to note, right, that since I um, do irreversible aggregation, I have no guarantee or no requirement that those structures should go to the equilibrium phase. Sorry. Yes. In this third case, you use which one of the two algorithms you used before? Uh, I mean, either will give you the same results. Yes, in, in the, for those pictures, it's the first. OK. But it's not. Yes. I'm going to use the first and all the rest, by the way. Just, you know, just base case, and then I vary it in different directions, if you will. Um, OK, so we see the fibers, but where do they come from? And again, the real answer is I don't really know. But you know, I have a story that I tell myself at night when I go to bed. And uh, I'd like to just share it with you, all right? The idea is to start from an initial aggregate that is small and anisotropic. And if you take that aggregate, you can 
take a new particle and add it. And there's two basic ways in which you can add it to the existing aggregate. You can add it to the size, or you can add it to the tip. And adding it to the side is pretty good in terms of surface cost, because the new particle is tucked into the existing structure. It forms a lot of contacts. But at the same time, since it's elastically mismatched with the rest of the medium, it's going to uh, generate a lot of deformation in the surrounding particles. And so the deformation cost is going to be relatively high. If you add the particle to the tip, well, you exactly have the opposite benefits and costs. But now if I imagine that I start with a very small initial uh, object, I could argue that that deformation energy, since the object is very small, doesn't penetrate very deep into the structure. And so that cost is fairly moderate. So maybe as long as my aggregate remains small, my, uh, my elastic cost is going, to be, is going to remain small. And so that um, solution is going to be a favored one. But as I add more and more particles to the side, I'm going to have a thicker and thicker aggregate. And that elastic cost is going to rise, which means that after some time, some amount of aggregation, then this way of adding the particles will now become favorable. And as I add particles to the tip, essentially my object is growing in a one directional, in a directional way. And therefore, I stand to obtain a fiber. Well, I don't know if that's completely correct. It's, in practical terms, it's a difficult to test hypothesis, but at least in the explanation that I've given you, there's nothing that tells you that your particles have to be hexagons, right? Or that they have to have a certain amount of irregularity. So what we did is to test uh, whether the same type of fiber formation can happen with different types of particles. Here are the hexagons that you already know. Here's an almost regular hexagon. Actually, up to 1% it's a regular hexagon. This one is more irregular. And in each of those cases, you form fibers in pretty much the same region. And it's actually perhaps more impressive than you realize, because uh, here I present everything to you in terms of that dimensionless sigma. But let's imagine that I didn't rescale sigma in terms of the characteristic frustration energy of my system, like I explained to you before. Actually, the critical sigma to get fiber formation between those two cases will differ by seven orders of magnitude. But if you do the rescaling that I've dictated to you before, then they collapse almost perfectly on that diagram. And the same comment is valid if you take a shape that's completely different, pentagons, which give rise to, in my opinion, the most beautiful fibers, um, or octagons, or actually it works with other types of gons. Okay? So, uh, what have I learned? Yes? How does it work for pentagon? I don't understand how it can be both like. Uh, in, in the end? No. So uh, you don't have bulk in this diagram, but no. if you go high enough, you're going to get a bulk. In the weights, it seems to be both. To be, uh, sorry. It, inside the, the fiber, yes. it seems that they are joint, but we know that they don't tie the plane. So what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you, let me tell you the extreme case. If you go to high enough tension, those pentagons will form a bulk, all right? Oh, I'll tell you. I'll okay. tell you how. Okay. okay. But you know. So what have I learned here? Um, essentially, what I want to argue is that this, you know, collapse into this uh, sigma tilde representation essentially tells me that my basic idea of uh, that fiber formation being driven by a competition between frustration and adhesion appears to be the correct one because that's really the way in which I design my rescaling. Okay. But there remain many strange points in the story that I've told you so far. First of all, I'm pretty sure you're not completely satisfied by that strange irreversible growth algorithm. Uh, another aspect is that uh, you know this is defor the deformation that you, know, you might believe or not that it completely captures uh, what happens in a protein. And uh, perhaps another point of frustration for you, not for the particles, would be that um, I've told you that those structures are metastable, but I didn't really put a number on it. I mean, how long-lived do you expect them to be? And what I'd like to do is to present you with another model, which on top of you know, trying to show that uh, the phenomenon is general, will perhaps convince you that the shortcomings of the first model are not fatal for the idea of fiber formation. Uh, that's work with uh, my former student, Pierre Bonseret, who's now at Princeton. And um, 
the model that I'll present to you is actually a three-dimensional model, but I'll first present to you a two-dimensional picture just for uh, pedagogical purposes, if you will. Okay, so this is how my system works. This is not going to be a continuous model anymore. This is going to be an on-lattice model. And my lattice is going to be a triangular lattice. And here I've outlined the Voronoi cells of my triangular lattice, which give you hexagons. Each of the particles is going to occupy one of those cells. And I've uh, decorated the vertices of each of the particles with two colors, blue and yellow, with the basic idea that blue likes blue and yellow likes yellow. All right, so again, I'm going to do this in the computer to start with. And I'm going to take particles, perhaps, from my uh, reservoir of particles. And I'm going to try putting them on the lattice. So this is the new state of my lattice. Then I can come in with a second particle. I'm going to try to put it next to its little friend. But of course, here you have a blue-blue, and that doesn't fit with a yellow-blue. So what I'm going to be able to do is to take that particle, which is identical to the first one, rotate it a bit, and then it comes here. It's good. You have two bonds that are realized, and therefore uh, you have an energy bonus of two units. Energy equals minus two now. Then you can come in with a third particle. And let's assume, for instance, that I would want to fit it here. Well, if I want to do that, I'm going to have to have three consecutive yellows. And I don't have that on my particle. So that move is forbidden in my model. It costs an infinite amount of energy. But what I can do is take my particle and put it here after a suitable rotation. I could also take it and put it on the side of the lattice that's disconnected from the existing aggregate. Or, uh, yes, so that's, that's what I can do. And then what I want to do is to run Monte Carlo simulations that will respect detail balance. And that goes towards addressing your possible concern about the uh, algorithm of the previous section. And in order to do this, in order to respect detail balance, of course, I have to be able to take each particle on the lattice and to put it back either on the res in the reservoir or to move it to another site if I work with an ensemble of constant number of particles. All right. As I told you, I'm not actually working in two dimensions. I'm working in a three-dimensional FCC lattice. The Voronoi cell of the FCC lattice is a rhombic hedron. Uh, it has 14 vertices, and what I do is that I color each of those 14 vertices in blue or yellow. And of course, you could imagine that that gives you a huge amount of possible particles that you might use, 2 to, two to the 14, but that's actually not true, because particles that are identical up to a rotation or a reflection are actually the same. And by weeding out all these redundancies, you end up that, with the fact that there's actually 288 possible distinct molecules. And the approach that we're going to follow is that we're going to take all of them, and everything that I'm going to do, I'm going to do to all of them, and I'm going to tell you, you know, the statistics over all the possible molecules that you can make. And Martin, sorry, when you yes. the two molecules can touch, so there is the uh, say constraint is satisfied, the energy is always the same. Or uh, so before you had an example in saying which you say, I mean, there is a, and either the energy is infinity or is two. I mean, in the previous yes. example. Yes. Uh, Yes, that's true. Okay. Yeah, for every pair. So in a sense, I mean, you don't care about the energy. Either the constraint is verified or it's not verified. Um, I mean, but yeah. depending on you know what your particle looks like. I mean, so the first way in which you care about the energy is that you can have the two particles touching or not yeah. touching. Yeah. Yes, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And then if your particle is very unfriendly to other particles, mm -hmm. you might have that you know it's being connected by two or three neighbors or something like this. Okay. instead of being fully coded. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, yes. All right, so let me do the most brute force, <coughs> brute, brute force uh, thing that you can imagine with this system. I just take a bunch of particles here for a certain molecule. They're all identical. And I'm going to run a Monte Carlo simulation. And I'm actually going to run simulated in neon, right? So I slowly cool down my system. And if I do it slowly enough, which, of course, it never happens, this is supposed to be guaranteed to give me um, to give me the ground state of the system. Okay, so let's look at what it gives. And for this specific type of molecule, well, it's pretty convincingly a fiber, I guess. So that's nice. Now I do it with all the other 287 molecules, and I find a variety of structures 
some of them are bulks, but there's actually a significant number that is either sheets or fibers. And by the way, I'm perfectly happy with sheets because those are infinite structures that have had their dimensionality reduced by the fact that you have this frustration energy building up if you grow them in three dimensions. So I would argue that they are as interesting as the fibers. And then I have a few undetermined undeterm ones and some finite clusters. So uh, that's interesting, but uh, is it trivial? Well, I'd like to try and convince you that it's not, uh, at least in the sense that the final shape of the structure that you're going to get is not in any clear way related to uh, the shape of the molecule that you take. And uh, I'd like to illustrate that with a guessing game. Here are four molecules. Who can tell me which one is going to give me a zero-dimensional aggregate, one, two, and three-dimensional? Each of the four cases are represented here. No guess? So the only person that actually dared to venture a guess to this question is my eight-year-old daughter, and she did surprisingly well. But here's what it gives. <coughs> Zero D, one D, two D, and three. That's what I would argue. And it's not obvious who would did what, right? Of course, a molecule that would be entirely yellow is going to give you a three-dimensional cluster, but that's not all there is to it. And okay, so that's, yes? Sorry, another question. So how much this is depends on the density, or initial density of the uh, molecules? Because it looks like if the density is high, yeah. then, I mean, maybe yes. it's more difficult to create this object. Yes, absolutely, and uh, high density will favor, well, a very low density will definitely disfavor fibers, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't have a real phase transition for one-dimensional objects. Uh, and that's something that I'm actually going to discuss okay. a little bit later, right? So I'm going to ask if I start with a certain chemical potential in, in my solution, what fibers, what, sorry, what objects I'm gonna, am I going to form in, in which sequence. Mm -hmm. But yes, definitely the density matters. Not hugely, right, because the chemical potential goes as log of the concentration. Mm -hmm. right. So in a way, in a simulation, you can only probe one concentration. <laughs> um, yes, so that's, of course, you know, looking at the molecules and saying what they're going to give, this is the most naive way that you would do anything. And I would just like to argue that we tried things that are slightly clever, and they all, slightly more clever, and they all failed miserably. Here are you know, two of the instances when we thought we were most better. Uh, we were taking one particle and then take another particle and see, uh, you know, take one particle from the reservoir and you know, put it there. Uh, what is the probability that putting it there is actually going to give you an acceptable configuration? That's what we call specificity. Each of the points here is uh, for one of the for one of the, of the molecules that I presented to you. And what I'd like to argue is that there isn't a very clear correlation between the dimensionality that you get and the specificity. Okay? There's a few points there, but most of the mass is actually there. So. All right, clever idea number two. Um, try to estimate the kissing number. So I mean, Pierre did a beautiful in-depth uh, algorithm the depth first algorithm where he takes one particle and then he creates the first layer of hydration uh, putting in as many particles as possible okay so what's the maximum number of particles that you can make satisfying your you know uh, yellow hates blue constraints around that first particle that gives you the kissing number that's the number of particles that you can fit around the second one and again there's no obvious correlation so we don't have a good predictor of what dimension e, your dimensionality you're going to get from the nature of, uh, of your in initial molecule. But um, what we'd still like to do, even though we're not able to predict what's going to happen, is to try and estimate how good the fibers are, uh, you know, how things depend on a number of variables, such as the initial density as you were proposing, and also how long-lived you could expect the fibers to be. And in order to address those questions, what we do is that we take you know, one type of molecule and we try to make a dictionary of all the periodic structures that you can make out of that molecule. And the way in which we do this 
is that we you know, say, oh, all right, what's the best uh, structure that you can make that has one molecule per unit cell? And then what's the best structure that you can make with two molecules per unit cell, etc., up to 48 molecules per unit cell. Right? And varying the lattice vectors at the same time, that gives you 4,000 different super lattices that we, in each case, decorate optimally. And so the question that we ask is, among those 4,000 candidate structures, some of them are three-dimensional, but also two-dimensional or one-dimensional, because you can leave holes in the structure that I described before, what is, for instance, the best fiber? And for the case that I've shown you, the best fiber is uncannily similar to the one that you got through your Monte Carlo simulations. So maybe it's not such a bad guess. But interestingly, even though we do get the best fiber, we don't get the best structure. Because the best structure is a bulk. And actually, fibers are never, not for a single one of two, the 288 molecules, fibers are never the best structure. So it's quite reminiscent of the first part of the talk. They're good, but they're not the best. And yet, they seem to form very readily. And so what we wanted to do is to account for that fact that they will form very readily. And the way in which we've tried to picture this is through simple nucleation theory. So you start with a solution of particles that have a certain given chemical potential, okay, which can be anything. And then what you're going to ask is, what is the nucleation barrier to nucleating each one of your 4,000 candidate structures? And for to know this, of course, you have to well, work out the competition between a certain, certain surface cost and a bulk gain, which is standard nucleation theory, right? So you have to evaluate the surface tension of your structure, the dimensionality of your structure, and the uh, bulk energy of the particle inside your structure. And then you do all this, and of course you find that um, your energy has a certain, uh, a certain barrier, that's a nucleation barrier, and if you go over that nucleation barrier, it's all downhill from there, and your structure is going to continue to grow. Oh, sorry, I yes. understand. So you are doing nucleation of the uh, sheets and bulbs from where? From what? I mean, what is the initial state? I don't understand the. Uh, uh, the idea is: imagine I have a sheet, you know, candidate sheet structure, yeah. right? Yeah. I look at the energy of a single particle, or maybe two particles, or three particles, yeah. etc. Okay, you create from nothing. I mean, create from, from nothing. Yes. Okay. So you, you take particles from the reservoir and okay. you put them there. Okay, and of course the cost of adding particles will depend on the chemical potential of your reservoir, if, <coughs> if you picture it in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the good thing is for each of the uh, many structures that we've determined, we know from our super lattice study which, uh, you know, what the value of each of those numbers is. So for each of our structures, we can work out a certain nucleation barrier, and therefore equivalently, we can decide what the time to nucleation of that first structure will be. And if you take the low temperature limit, then it's always the structure that has the lowest nucleation barrier, which is going to nucleate first. So take a solution with a certain chemical potential. You know what the first structure to nucleate will be. And, well, actually, yes. You know what the first structure will be, and then let's see what happens, right? So here's a, you know, just a toy example where I have a certain molecule that has three favorable structures, one fiber, one sheet, and one bulk. Okay, and the nucleation energy is represented as the vertical axis, and it's given as this formula of the parameters that we, uh, that we discussed before. This is a chemical potential in the horizontal axis. And now I imagine starting with a system that has a certain initial chemical potential. At that initial chemical potential, the structure with the lowest <coughs> nucleation energy is a fiber. So I'm going to form my fibers first. Once my fiber has started, most of the particles from my solution are going to go into fibers because they're more stable uh, structures and I'm at very low temperature. And so what's going to happen is that I'm going to drain particles from the solution into the fibers. And the amount of particles that's going to remain in the solution is going to be at equilibrium with the fibers, which is going to buffer the chemical potential of my solution to that energy per particle of the fiber structure. 
And then once you're, once you're there, you wait. Because you have your solution with that chemical potential. And the next thing that can happen is nucleating that sheet that's here. And you have to wait for that amount of time, or you know, that nucleation barrier, until you get the, four, the, first, uh, the first piece of sheet that appears. At some point, that's going to happen. Therefore, you're going to start forming sheets all over. You're going to buffer your solution to the sheet concentration. And then you wait again for an even longer time. And then the bulk starts. You buffer your solution here. And since this is a ground state structure, you don't move anymore. OK? So my point is, if you give me a starting chemical potential, I can always give you a timeline of what the different phases, successive phases, will be for any given molecule. Uh, in this case, fiber and sheets and bulk as a function of time. So I'm going to do this for each of my 288 molecules. And I'm going to tell you, as a function of time, uh, what fraction of all my molecules are going to be in aggregates of 0, 1, 2, or 3 dimensions. And clearly, in this example, you have mostly 1D in the beginning. Uh, but you know, this is a log scale of the nucleation barrier. Right, which is itself the log of the time. So it's a log of log of time. And just to give you an idea, the age of the universe is somewhere around here. <laughs> so yes, fibers are not the, more sta the most stable structure, but they're pretty damn good. So they're metastable, and they last for a long time. And if I present you with other initial chemical potential, that picture is actually preserved down to chemical potentials so low that you know you start from such dilute solutions that the fibers themselves are never stable. So of course, trivially, you're not going to get fibers in those situations. All right. Um, it's all on lattice, right? Perhaps a lot of the ingredients here are more sound than in the first section of the talk. But what happens if you have something that's uh, in continuum space? And this is quite preliminary here, but we've tried to uh, play the same game in continuum space with uh, lamps. Uh, that is with uh, brown in dynamics, I think, in this case. Or was it molecular dynamics? I don't remember exactly. Um, those are the same four molecules that you saw before. And if I run the simulations, what happens is actually pleasantly consistent with what I had before. Because I would like to argue that this is zero dimensional aggregates, maybe. This is one dimensional, not too bad. That's the plane. And this, you know, three dimensional ish. OK. Those are my two examples, right? So now, what does frustration mean? Well, I'll tell you what people like frustration to mean in soft matter. Uh, what they like to think of is you just take uh, two objects that have a geometry that is not compatible. And you know the standard example would be perhaps you cut the strip out of a sphere, and you try to flatten that strip onto the flat surface. Of course, if you do this, you're going to have to distort your sheet, and you're going to have an elastic cuff that's associated to it. Okay? So you can think of the first uh, example that I've gave, given you in those terms. right? What would be the best width in this case because if I have something that's very thin, I'm going to have little frustration energy by flattening it onto the plane. But at the same time, I'm going to have a lot of surface energy. So what would be the optimal width in this case? Well, you know, you have a certain elastic energy associated with doing this, a certain line tension. And this one goes up, this one goes down. So you have a minimum somewhere that's going to tell you, well, this you know, should be the best, uh, the best width to have in your system. And you know, it's not a stupid idea at all. It applies in many cases. Um, one of them is uh, actually the inverse of what I've told you, but it works, uh, it works pretty well nonetheless. You just put colloids that are uh, constrained to come onto the surface of a water droplet. And uh, those colloids really like to assemble into a hexagonal lattice. So they want to be flat, but you force them to be in a space that's curved. And what people have shown experimentally is that you essentially get strips that have a certain width and that are compatible with the estimate that I've given you before. Another pretty neat example is uh, due to Greg Grayson. He thinks about um, filaments that want to twist with respect to one another. And if you try to twist them with respect to one another, uh, then 
you'll see that hexagonal packing in, is not always the best because, well, hexagonal, hexagonally packing straight rods is actually pretty easy, but if you incline them with respect to one another, then you're going to distort the packing. And what he's shown is that you can actually map this uh, problem of packing in this cross section onto a problem of packing actual disks onto a certain curved surface that you can calculate. And he's also shown that in some cases, uh, it's actually more favorable to do this packing with locally hexagonal border as some kind of a fiber which would give rise not to uh, straight um, bundles of fibers, but rather to um, twisting tapes, which you know, would be a similar example of minimizing the energy by making slender structures. But what I'd like to argue is that the things that I've shown you uh, until now, to my disappointment perhaps, don't fit very well into that structure, and uh, into that uh, framework. And the reasons for this are several. The first one is that those are not equilibrium structures. And everything that I've described in the last two slides is an energy minimization algorithm. And the fibers that I've shown you don't exist at equilibrium. Maybe there are fibers that exist at equilibrium, but I've, at least in the first case, I haven't found them yet. The other consideration is that, uh, you know, if you have a curved surface, it's like having a certain given topological charge, a certain number of defects in a crystalline packing per unit area. And the thing is, in the structures that I've shown you before, well, uh, you can actually vary this topological charge. And so that means that the constraints of having a certain curvature in, in, um, imposed on your space is not fixed in my case. For instance, here in the Pentagon case, I uh, can introduce additional saddle-like defects here, uh, inducing a, introducing a negative an angle deficit uh, in order to flatten my structure in the far field. So uh, essentially, I can make a structure that will not be curved on large length scale, but actually flat. And then uh, the last argument that I would like to bring up is the fact that the reasoning that I've told you about before, having a certain constant curvature per unit surface, a certain con constant curvature for the surface that you try to flatten onto the plane, actually doesn't apply here because uh, the fibers that I've shown you before form whether your you know, potential curved surface has a positive curvature, a negative curvature in the case of the octagons, or even zero curvature in the case of the hexagons. So, I'm not sure what to think, perhaps, but for the fact that when I take all these various irregular objects, the, this, yes, those various irregular objects, they seem to want to aggregate into slender objects, and especially fibers. And I'm going to reiterate the fact that I've taken uh, you know, examples that were as different from one another as I could find, and yet they show a very similar morphology of very robust yet metastable fibers. Now, what are the implications here? Well, I mean, the first motivation that I've presented to you is the idea of trying to understand protein aggregation. And of course, we haven't done anything that's very specific to the specific structure of any given protein, but maybe there's still something interesting that's to be taken from it. And um, I would present that thing as a shift in the burden of proof. In a way, structural biologists uh, up until now have you know, always tried to explain why fibers form. Uh, maybe this structure has a certain type of beta sheets that are going to stack together or other arguments. But what we're saying is that you generically expect fibers to form. So maybe the thing that needs explaining is not the ones that do form fibers, but rather any structures that don't. And the next possible implication is actually for self-assembly, which I started at the very beginning of my talk with. And I've told you about the smart people who you know, just tell the particles what to do in order to get the structure that they want. I think the stupid people like us have a different approach. In a way, what we're doing here is that instead of telling the particles what to do, we ask them what they want to do. And perhaps this has value for uh, engineering structures, because essentially if you know what the particles 
naturally want to do, you can harness this tendency in order to make structures that will look like what you want them to look like. Thank you. Questions? Um, perhaps I missed something, but uh, is there a possibility to, to go from a, a bulb growth to a dendritic growth? Or this is out of the scope of what you are doing? Um, in each case, I've given my system the freedom to do dendritic growth, but it hasn't taken that option. But? But it hasn't taken that option. No? They don't want to do it so much. There I have to specify, perhaps what you have in mind is uh, diffusion-emitted aggregation. Mm. Yes, but uh, so, I mean, if you do, <laughs> in each of the cases that I've shown you, this can't really happen because you don't have the steric hindrance to diffusion. Essentially, my particles in the gas never diffuse. They can teleport from one place to the other, which is, I guess, reasonable if you think that diffusion is very fast in those systems. Mm. So I've definitely, uh, you know, impeded DLA in this way. But you know, apart from that, they just don't seem to want to form dendritic structures. Or what you might say is that the trees that I've told you about in the beginning were your dendritic structures. And they happen for a certain domain of the parameter space, uh, but they still leave intact the place where your system is going to form fibers. Other questions? Yeah. So can you the first part when you when you had the, the, the phase diagram with sigma, yes. so, uh, and you take, for example, hexagons, then yes. you increase sigma, you have fibers, and then at some point you have uh, uh, the bulk. Yes. But how, how is it the transition between the two? W what about the transition? The transition between the fiber uh, yes. phase and the bulk phase. Is it sharp, or, is it, or the bulk is just a very large fiber? No, the bulk is not a very large fiber. You have something that's starting to, I mean, there's a pretty distinct transition mm -hmm. between, you know, objects are gonna that are growing like this mm -hmm. and objects that start to grow essentially like this. Okay. okay, so if you, I mean, all I can tell you, of course, I don't have an underlying theory for all that stuff, uh, but what I can tell you is that in the simulations, they look quite distinct, right? And you can, I mean, any bulk that we've encountered to let them grow more and more, and they just become very large. And if you take one one of these structures, like given sigma, and then you change sigma, so you take a fiber, yeah. and okay. then you change sigma. You have the same dream as me, I think. Okay. I think you want to increase sigma, have a yeah, diverging exactly. length scale, exactly. a diverging width, and uh, that diverging width will give you a second order transition into, into a bulk, okay. right? Just a continuous width that goes from finite to infinite, mm -hmm. right? I guess it's second order in that sense. Uh, I've, you know, dreamt of having that, but haven't been able to uh, identify it in the simulations that we have. Perhaps part of the reason for it is because we have irreversible growth, right? Because if you want the width to diverge, you really want your system to, you know, nicely optimize its shape across the whole width of the fiber. So you want to leave it a lot of time to relax in order for the whole width of the fiber to be you know, really the best possible structure, not only geometrically, but also topologically. But since we add particle after particle, mm -hmm. we never give it enough time to do that. So it doesn't mean that you know, with a more gentle growing procedure, perhaps that's my hope, uh, you wouldn't get that, but we don't see it in this case. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, uh, I'm not sure I understood correctly, but when you were saying about, uh, so if you change the chemical potential, if you change the proportion of things you're going to see at in the end, like if it's fibers of bulk or... Anything. No, actually, you always get the ground state in the very end. It doesn't depend okay. on the chemical potential. And then if you look, come with me, if you take experiments with real fibers and diseases, if you look at the time scale over which it happens, you could tell if it fits or not with the model you're proposing. Then. So, um, there, there is, there definitely, is some polymorphism of the fibers that you get in experiments. I don't know of any specific case where someone is able to relate that to the starting concentration that you have. Right? Again, it's a little bit difficult to do, but it depends on you know all the things that you expect, biological things to depend on, usually salt, pH, those kind of 
Yes, but I don't have you know, the specific smoking gun you're, you're arguing for. Okay, I have a final question. So uh, compared to the things that you say our self-assembly, so you say that, uh, so you don't understand if what you think is then, if you do self-assembly, if you do it in equilibrium, you won't see, I mean, the people that do self-assembly, they look at equilibrium, and this is why they don't see fibers in general. So if they did, if they take their, their favorite model of self-assembly, they do a very fast quench, they would find fibers, but since they are in equilibrium, they don't do it, or because they are too smart, so they, they are looking at, let's say, very special form of particles, then in that case, you don't see fibers, but they are fine-tuned, and even if you do quench, so you do zero time or very small temperature, then you won't see, fi you won't see fibers anyway. All right, this is a you know, very rich question. There's the first you know, assumption under what you say that those people never see fibers form. Yeah, well, and you know, yeah, it's okay. an open question. Okay. Uh, perhaps I can tell you what my dream in life is. It's to go through the garbage can of pro protein crystallographers. Mm -hmm. Because you know what protein crystallographers try to do, right? They just have a certain protein that's not supposed to crystallize, but they want to crystallize it anyway because they want to work out the structure in uh, X-ray crystallography. So they try a bunch of different physical chemical conditions, and then sometimes they form a crystal, they're super happy, and they put it in the X-ray machine. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, 99.9% of the conditions they try, they just put in the trash can. My first question is, how many of those are actually fibers? Mm -hmm. right? Because they don't care. They just throw them away. Now, you're saying, you know, what do smart people do and what do smart people achieve? Smart people don't always succeed. I don't know how general this statement it is. Um, but the thing is, you know, you can design a structure very cleverly and then it can fail to give you the structure that you've designed it for. One example of this is, for instance, the you know, DNA-coded colloids that people have been trying extensively, but somehow they have, as far as I understand, never gotten it to be a very reliable way of forming target structures. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you, know, you can try to be smart and try to design, and that's the thing that they try to do. They try to design the ground states, but sometimes the kinetics gets in the way and prevents you from getting the ground state that you've designed. Yeah. And this would be, you know, one of the things that can happen along the way. And if you want to do self-assembly that works, perhaps you also need to understand this kinetics and the places where you're going to get stuck yeah. before you get the minimum that you want to get to. Yeah, well, what I was wondering is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an expert at all, so I, I don't know very well, but I remember people that do thousands of simulation over thousands of models, in which they make sure you, for example, the group of Sharon Rotzer, mm -hmm. you yes. a lot of different structure. So I wonder, in that case, if you do a quench, would you see fibers coming up? I mean, I mean, what they get is just because they uh, are at equilibrium. Because, as you say, if you wait long enough, you, you fibers are not the ground state. So I was just wondering, if they do quench in their model, mm -hmm. did they get fibers? Yeah, this is a so I think there's a large number of Sharon Gloucester's, uh, you know, a large amount of her yeah. work that's actually uh, purely yeah. entropic. Yeah. So you have purely repulsive structures, yeah. uh, and you know entropy is going to decide the crystalline structure that you're going to get. So you can you can get yeah. fibers from that. Yeah. The work that I've discussed more extensively is the one of uh, Dan Frankel that I, that, that I discussed with him. And you know in many cases there's one example where they just take spherical colloids and they put 40 sticky patches mm -hmm. at random places ar yeah. around it, right? And in the and they they look for a good crystal. Perhaps very similarly to the way I described from uh, protein crystallographers, right? Mm -hmm. So they restrict their study in such a way that in the end they present you with a beautiful crystal. And we've discussed, you know, about what structures they found along the way and threw in the trash can. And they did remember all of it because they weren't looking for it specifically. But they definitely remembered that they did get some two-dimensional and one-dimensional structure. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we want to, you know, go and look for more specifically. But because those objects are very complicated, the way uh, in which you look for structures tends to bias you a little bit and perhaps blindside you in terms of observing the fibers in all the cases mm -hmm. that you might uh, actually observe them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are no other questions. Thank you again. Thank you.